At 7.01, I'm going to call the meeting of the Board of Selectmen to order. Our first item of business is the Pledge of Allegiance, and I would ask Selectman Muska to lead us in that. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Sarah. I see all four members of the Board of Selectmen are, or all five members of the Board of Selectmen are in attendance. Our, um, agenda approval. I have no added agenda items, um, so I'd ask for a motion to accept the agenda as presented. Sarah Muska, Selectman, I'll move to approve the agenda as presented. Is there a second? Worry, this is I'll second that. Any discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the roll. Selectman D'Souza. Aye. Selectman Baker. Aye. Selectman Muska. Aye. Selectman Nordell. Aye. Um, our next item of business is the approval of the special meeting minutes from the August 12th special meeting of the Board of Selectmen. Is there a motion? Selectman Nardell will move to approve the special meeting minutes from August 12th, 2020. Is there a second? Marie D'Souza, I'll second that. Motion has been made and seconded. Are there any corrections? Sarah. Sarah Muska, Selectman. I did not find Selectman reports for myself, Selectman Nordell, or you, Jason, and I didn't see them posted online either. Um, so I don't know if they just weren't included, if that was an oversight or. No, Pen Peg had sent out an email to that effect yesterday, I think. Um, am I thinking of the right meeting, Peg, or am I thinking of the August no, 20th? Meeting? I think the one that I was confused with and I was looking for reports for was the 20th, which I have not posted yet. So I think what I'll do with that is I will go and just transcribe from your minutes. Um, if I did not put these on, Sarah, then that's my transgression. We should probably post them again. Okay. So with that said, if there are no other corrections, um, we could postpone approval of these till our next meeting. Okay. Uh, is there a motion to postpone? So Selectman, Nor no. Selectman Nordell will second that. Motion made by Marie, seconded by Charlie. Um, the question is now on postponement of the minutes from our August 12th meeting. Um, any discussion? Seeing none. Uh, Selectman D'Souza. Um, it says they were attached. I'm just double checking my folder here. Hang on. It says Selectman Report Balza, Musk, and Nodell, G, H, and I. Hang on. I'm going through the package. All right. Okay, aye. Selectman Baker. Aye. Selectman Muska. Aye. Selectman Nordell. Aye. We will take those up again at our meeting on the 17th. About uh, Tuesday, August 18th. Sarah Muska, Selectman, I'll move to approve the minutes from August 18th, 2020, the public hearing minutes. Is there a second? Second. Motion made by uh, Selectman Muska, seconded by Selectman D'Souza. Any further discussion or corrections on these? Bye-bye. Seeing none, Selectman D'Souza. Aye. Selectman Baker. Aye. Selectman Muska. Aye. Selectman Nordell. Aye. All right. 
Thank you, folks. Public participation. Um, this is one of the public's two opportunities to address the board. Um, I'd ask that you identify yourself by name and address for the record. Um, is there any comments from the public? Is there any comment from the public? Seeing none, there will be another opportunity later in the meeting for the public to address the board. Um, we are now on to communications. I don't think I have anything new this meeting. I feel like we've been meeting a lot lately, despite the month of August being goofy. I feel like we've been, I feel like I've seen you all quite a bit in the last few weeks. Um, so I don't have any new communications at this point. Um, wards, commissions, resignations, and appointments. At our uh, last meeting, we appointed Stanley Kement to a one-year term for the Building Commission. It rightly should have been a six-year term. Apologies for the oversight there, but we do have it this time, I swear. Um, so if, we, if I could have a, a motion to appoint Mr. Kement for a term expiring August 1st, 2026. Selectman Nordell will move to appoint Stanley Kemet for the Building Commission as a regular member for a term expiring 8-1-2026. Is there a second? Sarah Muska, Selectman, I'll second. Motion has been made and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, Selectman D'Souza. Aye. Selectman Baker. Aye. Selectman Muska. Aye. Selectman Nordell. Aye. Okay. Um, the last two appointments are members of the Diversity Council. Um, this is the new commission that we established last, um, last meeting. And these are the two applicants that we have thus far, but I, I understand that uh, Ms. Rivera is also working on um, enticing others to submit their name for consideration. Um, so, Let's get them started. Selectman Nordell will move to postpone appointing any members of the Diversity Commission okay. or Diversity Council, I should say, I should say. until we have, until we have a number of applications. Uh, what is a number? More than five in which we stated would start the council. Okay, so you want five before we name anybody? That's my motion. Okay, is there a second? Sorry, Charlie, I'm just, I was just getting clarification on what your intention was. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a second? Sarah Muska, Selectman, I'll second. Any discussion? Um, I don't see any reason to wait, so I'll be voting, I guess, no on the motion. I don't understand why we would wait. So my point is on it is that I, I know of several people that want to um, put in applications for this position. They just have not gotten around to it. And um, I think we're going to have more than nine. And we're going to have to actually make a selection and therefore, I think it's fair that we have all of those applications before we appoint anyone and cut out someone who may fit better down the road. I guess from, my, from what I've always seen it done is it's very much on any commission. None of them are treated any differently. Um, it's basically first come, first serve. And then sometimes we have had a situation where there's more than we need. So then it becomes a, you know, I, I think what it, I, if I'm not incorrect, the way it's been handled in the past is whoever got stamped first, they're the ones that get voted first. So I, 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 again, I don't see a need to, to wait. <clears throat> well, considering the nature like, like, of this council wait, like, and its, its background and what it's going to represent, I think we need to be diverse and wait and see what we have for applicants rather than going on a first come first serve basis. So I'm, I'm thinking of a, a model that um, comes to mind and that's the American Heritage River Commission. Um, those folks have a set number of 
participants that are actually, you know, uh, appointed sworn voting members, but they have a much broader coalition of folks who participate in, in the work that they do. It's not just limited to, um, you know, who's approving meeting minutes and the like. So um, if, and I think what Charlie's uh, intonation is, is that we might, we may find we have more applicants than we can see. Um, and I think that'd be a great problem that we could work with uh, and, and to not necessarily turn anyone away. Um, Although, if past is prologue, I'm not sure we're going to have nine applicants either because it's it's pretty difficult in today's world to get people to volunteer to, in any capacity. So, yeah, I would just say like, if, if these people want in, where's the application? Get on it. It's not that hard to get one in. You can download it. You can email it back. You can drop it off. There's all kinds of ways to do it, but it's quick and easy. So I'm not sure what the delay would would be. Marie. Yeah, I think we delayed um, getting this committee started um, right from the beginning. We had some issues with the way it was written um, and it took the time to go ahead and redo that. We finally agreed upon it. Um, I have no issue with either one of the two candidates that, that have put their names forward, one being the person that was most um, interested in starting the committee and the individual that actually did the Black Lives Matter um, gathering um, in town. Uh, so I think they both have good credentials and both have uh, desire and need um, to get this committee going. Um, so I would like to go forward tonight and appoint both of these individuals. The council is still not going to start without at least five members. It's not going to start without at least three members. But once you have the council started, other people will definitely start stepping forward. And, yeah, and again, it's like, if you're interested, what are you waiting for? Get it in, let's do it. Uh, Alan, you have to understand some of these people um, are not internet savvy. They um, don't have access to internet. Um, remember what kind of council we're starting here. Um, we have to be mindful of all the variables. Sure, and it's still, even if you're gonna do it old school, you could get it all done by the time of our next meeting. Two weeks is plenty of time to, you know, how, you know to go to the hall, ask for, a, you know, ask for one and, and mail it back if you gotta, you know, it's plenty of time. I, I, I'm, just, I'm not seeing a reason why we would delay this. In fact, I think that if it starts filling up, maybe people will be spurred to, you know, Get going. If you really want on, get on. Hmm. Okay, so the, the motion is on, um, unless there's any further discussion, the motion is on postponement of the appointments. Um, I'll call a roll. Selectman D'Souza. Nay. Selectman Baker. No. no. Selectman Musco. Aye. Selectman Nordell. Aye. I vote no. And for the reasons that I think we just, I, I think we have delayed it a long time. Um, so we're, the a motion, an affirmative motion would be appropriate here um, to pick up the appointment of the candidates or not. <clears throat> make a motion since they're both on the same um, council and same uh, ex uh, expiration date of theirs, their term, make a motion to appoint Richard Laborious to the Diversity Council for a term ending August 20, 2024, and Anna Maria Rivera to the Diversity Counter, uh, Council for a term expiring August 20, there a second. Second. Any discussion? Just like to thank them both for getting on it and, and um, helping us get this thing started. And especially Anna, who um, this was her idea. Other, other comments? Selectman D'Souza. Yes. 
Selectman Baker? Yes. Selectman Muska? Aye. Selectman Nordell? Aye. Okay. Um, our next agenda item involves um, Attorney Lee Hoffman from Pullman and Conley. Um, Attorney Hoffman is not a stranger to any of us. Um, he had, he's working with us on a number of projects uh, and has done some, some due diligence for us uh, in terms of energy solicitation. I spoke with you folks, I can't remember, a couple of meetings ago um, and presented a couple of different options that Attorney Hoffman had, um, had discussed with Len Norton, Joe, Hauer, Joe Sauerhofer and myself. Um, and I brought those to you and we had some unanswered questions. Uh, I have some answers to those questions, and um, I think Attorney Hoffman might have some additional update to provide to us that might be relevant to the discussion. So uh, I would turn it over to Attorney Hoffman. Sir, thank you for joining us this evening. Well, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here, but if you call me sir again, I may have to reach through the line and punch you in the nose <laughs> for Selectman Bowser. Um, so I'm not sure what the questions were all in, in their entirety because I wasn't here at the last meeting, but... First, I'd like to compliment uh, Len and Joe and the team for the town. And the reason why I want to compliment them is I, I've got good news for you, which is you're getting a better electric rate for your town's electricity than any of us could possibly get in the open market. And doing the due diligence, you've got a really good um, electric rate now with your contract. Unfortunately, that contract is only valid for another year and a quarter as I understand it. Um, and so that was the, the point behind taking a look at it. But right now you're paying 6.9 cents for your electricity. Your distribution and transmission charges are significantly more, but everybody in the Eversource service territory pays those same rates. And there's not much you can do about that, particularly given how far flung and spread out um, the various users of electricity are in the town. But the standard offer that people get from Eversource right now is at 7.4 cents. And when you add that up over the, over the significant amount of kilowatt hours that, that the town of East Windsor uses and really any municipality uses, it's a significant savings and you're to be commended for that. What, unfortunately, even with the relatively low rate that the town is charged, you still spend, as everybody on this board knows, you still, still spend over a million dollars a year in electric costs. And that just happens to be because you're located inside of Connecticut, which is the second most expensive state in the union electrically and the most expensive state in the lower 48. Um, and there's not a whole lot we can do about that. We don't have coal resources. We don't have the large hydroelectric resources behind the Hoover Dam and, and things like that out west. So we're a little bit stuck in what our electric rates are. And obviously, as we've all been seeing in the news, Pure is watching that. But as I was taking a look at how you would do an electricity procurement, I think we're now at a point where I would suggest to you that um, if you can continue to get your electricity through, as you've been doing in the past, taking advantage of the buying power of CCM, that may very well be advantageous to you, um, just given the fact that you are getting a remarkably low rate and certainly better rate than the town would get on its own. If you want to do renewable energy as the source of your electricity, that could certainly be done. And I know that the town has been approached by several developers of renewable energy, not just for the projects that are being developed in town, but also to provide the town with some of the, that renewable energy or renewable energy like that through something called virtual net metering, where by virtue of doing virtual net metering, you run the meter essentially backwards at several of the town's locations, up to five per project. And you take advantage of the fact that you're generating electricity at a wholesale price, but you run back the meter at your retail rate. However, that queue is currently fully occupied and there are no new projects that are being accepted at this time. The word on the street uh, with the legislature is that the Energy and Technology Committee as part of its omnibus bill to deal with some of the energy issues in Connecticut would also like to expand the virtual net metering queue and let more municipalities take advantage of it. 
but that bill hasn't even been um, sent to the leg sent by that out by the Energy and Environment Committee yet, much less voted on by the legislature. So at this stage of the game, that's a little bit of speculation. The good news is we have plenty of time to take a look at all of these issues because the contracts aren't up for quite some time. But I think First Selectman Bowser and Mr. Norton and Mr. Sauerhofer wanted to get a jump on this and so had me take a look at it. That, sir, is pretty much my report in a nutshell. So, so that's... You know, being that this is such a large piece of our budget, you know, it, it's, it's, as you pointed out, Councillor, it's a, a million dollar expense line. Um, right. Anything we could do to mitigate that, you know, and get that cost down is to the taxpayer's benefit. So, exactly right. And, and anything that you can do to keep rising prices from rising further also goes straight to the taxpayer's benefit. 100% correct. Right. So, so is, is your recommendation that the best course for us would be to, um, continue along with CCM or would it make sense to actually try and investigate the VNM pathway? Is there a pathway to the VNM pathway right now? Um, how, what can we do to make sure this cost doesn't get crazy? Right. Sure. So what I would suggest to you is a twofold approach. The first thing that I would suggest is because we still have a contract with CCM, I would try and ascertain what CCM's rate is going to be for the next contract tranche. As I understand it, the last contract you had was a three-year contract that expires at the end of 2021. I would, I would suggest that somebody find out from CCM or the, the public power provider, which is the provider that CCM uses, what they anticipate, they may not have set the price yet. We are really early on this. Um, but if, if CCM has a sense as to what the rate is going to be for the next three years, then you know what your reasonable uh, worst case scenario is. You can work against that number, if you will. Um, you've been getting good, reliable service, and there haven't been any issues with the providers, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, after that, um, I would say in the next month or two, we will know from the legislature as to whether or not they're going to expand virtual net metering. If they're going to expand virtual net metering at that stage of the game, I would suggest that the town send out a, a request for qualifications and or a request for proposal to take a look at taking advantage of the virtual net metering program. And I'll explain that in a minute because um, I get that I'm speaking in gibberish. Um, but take a look at the virtual net metering program and see whether or not you could use a renewable energy resource and have an effective electric rate that is cheaper than what you're paying now. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the virtual net metering program, it is only available to municipalities, the state and agricultural facilities that use electricity, the, the advantage of it is if you, as, as everybody I think knows, if you put solar on the roof of a town building or on your own home, the meter runs essentially backwards as it, you generate kilowatts that go out onto the grid, but for metering purposes, the Eversource keeps track of those electrons that are generated and runs your meter back. So if you use 750 kilowatt hours and you generate 800 kilowatt hours, not only is your bill zero, but you get a 50 kilowatt hour credit. And then when it's winter time, you begin to erode that credit. And eventually by the time you're there in February or March, you're paying full electric rates again for whatever you use. But the idea behind that is you have to be physically wired to the solar project or the fuel cell or the wind turbine or what have you. Virtual net metering allows municipalities to take advantage of that same concept for up to five meters. So five buildings or your street lights or whatever, but five electric meters uh, without being physically located adjacent to those projects. And the project doesn't even have to be in town. It can be anywhere within the Eversource service territory. 
So if, for example, a developer is building a project in, say, Bloomfield, they can build that project in Bloomfield, have you be the beneficial customer, and essentially run your meters backwards from that Bloomfield location. They net meter that out, and they do it virtually because there's no electrical connection between the project and the town. The reason why this works as a potential cost-saving measure is that you're paying right now a transmission and distribution charge on your electric bill. And your transmission and distribution charge is actually more than, significantly more than, your generation charge when you look at the bill. And what the solar developers and the fuel cell developers will do, because that's mostly what the way that these things are, are done is through fuel cells and through solar development. What those renewable energy developers will do is they will essentially, while you'll still pay some transmission and distribution charge, it's significantly less. And the developer splits the difference in some algorithm uh, to be agreed upon by the town and the developer. And if the savings is sufficient, you can buy renewable energy, which is generally more expensive it winds up being slightly cheaper for the town by virtue of the fact that you no longer have this transmission and distribution charge that, you're, that, you, that Eversource is charging you. But as I said before, right now, other towns have subscribed to the program. There was a limited stack of these virtual net metering credits that were available, and those have been exhausted under the current program. There have been a lot of towns that have asked the legislature to uh, re-up the program and increase it. And it's my understanding that the leadership of the Energy and Technology Committee views that with favor. And so they're looking at doing that in the near future. If they do that, then you would be able to figure out whether or not virtual net metering is a good fit for the town. But I would indicate to you that you're getting a pretty good price on your electricity now. And so even if you do shave off costs on transmission and distribution, you still may not come out ahead, but it's at least worth running the RFP at that stage of the game to see if you can get a better deal. Did so, I thoroughly bore and confuse everybody? Well, it's pretty clear you're an expert on this. Um, but it's, uh, so our agreement with CCM is fr strictly on the, the generation cost. Correct. Right? So, and that's 6.9 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, we still have the, the transmission and delivery charge that's 14 and change, 14 cents and change a kilowatt hour. How do we knock that down? You move the town to, to another service territory, maybe in Massachusetts. Um, <laughs> I, I'm sorry, but, but there really isn't a good way to knock that down any. It's, it ever sources a utility and that rate is set by the Public Utilities Regulatory Authority now the the rate may come down pura put a rate hike abatement in place and there was a hearing on that last monday and there's continuing to be investigation in hearings but short of the state regulators determine what that rate is and that rate is going to be that rate whether you're east windsor or hartford or danbury if we were to put solar panels on town buildings or town property or install a fuel cell, would that adjust the transmission and delivery costs or are we still stuck with that no matter no, what? No, uh, that absolutely makes sense for the town. So if you, if, you in, if you install any renewable energy, any class one renewable energy source, which is really, as you point out, sir, um, fuel cells and solar, as long as you can connect that renewable energy resource to the entity that's going to use that electricity, you're no longer virtual net metering, you're just net metering. It's no different than putting solar on your rooftop. And, you know, for my house, I will tell you that we put solar on our rooftop five years ago and we financed it. We just mortgaged the solar panels like anything else. And because we're netting less electricity, because we generate all this electricity in the summer months, the, the, the cost of the solar panels were amortized by the savings on the renewable ener on the, on the energy cost, so that my electric bill was so much less than the cost of my solar panels that I was able to pay the mortgage payment every month and still pocket 
a, a significant amount of money, enough that it was noticeable in my pocket while paying off the financing charges with all the interest and everything else so that I was saving money from day one for putting it on my house. The same thing could, could and probably should happen with town properties, particularly if you can take advantage of an underutilized piece of grass where you can put some ground mounted solar in or something like that. The one catch that I would advise you is for my municipal clients that go this route, you do have to check your roofs to make sure that your roofs are sufficiently new and sufficiently strong that they can support the extra weight of the, the solar panels and, and the racking. But assuming your roof is, is in decent enough shape, um, and certainly any roof that's built in the last 10, 15 years would be, then that's a way to save money because you for everything that you generate at your at your facility, you're not uh, paying transmission and distribution charges because it doesn't go through it doesn't go through the wires. Okay. Any questions or comments for Attorney Hoffman? Marie. Yeah, um, I just want to make sure that my understanding is accurate. So you're saying right now we have about 16 months left on the five-year contract with CCM and we're paying 6%, uh, 6 cents per kilowatt and then 14% for the other fee um, and that we're better off staying with CCM for now. The question that we had last meeting was Jason gave us three options. Um, and it sounds like right now you're saying that we're best to wait because options are changing um, rather, yeah. than, rather than be specific. And then there was also a question if we went from CCM to you people handling our stuff, what was the cost? We know what the cost is from CCM, but we didn't know what the cost was going to be from um, your group. Well, the my group part. doesn't sell. We don't sell electricity. We're lawyers. We sell no. hot air to be certain, but we don't sell electricity. So um, uh, the only thing that I would help the town do is kind of run the RFP as you evaluate the various and sundry electricity providers. And I don't think that anybody was suggesting that you break the CCM contract. However, until we figure out, A, what the legislature is going to do, which we should have clarity on that in the next two months, okay. and then B, run an RFP process and then C, make the selections. In order to do that, particularly given the ordinary municipal budget cycle, it was probably better to think of that sooner rather than later, which is why uh, Mr. Bowser approached me and my firm to, to help out with that process. Um, so right but, now, but, uh, well, right now CCM is charging us a fee for that. And that's the fee that we were questioning what the difference was gonna be if we had your group handle that for us. So. I, if I could just interject here, Attorney Hoffman. Um, Thank you. So it's a, it, we do pay a monthly service charge to CCM to be part of their, their EPA. Um, okay. We've done a fair amount of uh, investigative work, or actually Attorney Hoffman has done a fair amount of investiga investigatory work into these options for us. I just want to make sure that the board is aware that um, because he would be acting in, in our capacity effectively as an energy manager instead of as an attorney, he has not billed us for one hour of, of his time so far. All of this research and uh, presentation that he's put forward has been just because he's a good guy. Um, so, the, and the reason that that's relevant is because when he and I spoke earlier and he shared the, the good news that we have a great deal right now, he pointed out that we probably wouldn't be able to realize enough savings to engage them in the structure that we had talked about when last we spoke about this. So as circumstances evolve over the coming months, there might be an opportunity to revisit that, but there wouldn't be any savings with which to pay him. So he, he made it clear to me in a conversation earlier that um, he, he shared all of those details. I, I appreciate that, Jason, for clarification. Thank you. Carly, did you have a question? I think I saw your hand. Yeah, it would, I mean, and this is, you know, maybe a little bit into the woods, but I, I was curious, uh, you spoke about the credits that the legislature would have to approve. Um, the fact that the legislature has to approve makes me think it's some sort of a subsidy. Is that what, what we're really talking about? Well, yes and no. What it is is the, the well, at the end of the day, what it is is it's a guaranteed price 
that the utilities work out with the developers for a term of 15 years. The utilities can't contract that kind of thing without either statutory or regulatory approval. And Pura has, Pura has ceded that, that approval to the legislature or the legislature has given Pura, probably more precise way to put it, is has given Pura just this much approval authority of this program. And it's a, it's a fixed dollar cap. So once the dollars of the virtual net metering program are exhausted, the utilities can't contract with the developers to do more. The idea behind it is rather than be a straight up subsidy where money's coming out of the general fund and then being given to developers, which is what several other states have done, New Jersey, to a lesser extent, Massachusetts, um, and other states, the problem with those subsidies is they tend to be more expensive than what the developers really need. The way that Connecticut has done it, which is actually, I think, rather clever from a cost standpoint, is forcing the developers to bid against one another against a fixed pot of money means that everybody sharpens their pencil and they really do put in their best prices. And I think that the Connecticut market is a little more competitive than some of the surrounding states. But right now, there's nothing for them to compete over. And that's, and that's what needs to be increased by the legislature. Once they win a particular competition, they get a contract for 15 years with a utility. They can take the revenue stream of that 15 year contract and take it to a lender and say, I have a guaranteed revenue stream. Can you loan against this? And the, the lenders are all too willing to loan against those because they know that it's a, a contract with a company that really by state law can't go out of business very easily. So they, they know they've got a guaranteed revenue stream to, to finance against. Thanks, interesting. Now under the, under the VNM program, you can only um, earmark up to three megawatts of power per, per project. Um, we have in total three megawatts of power, but that's inclusive of town facilities, school facilities, and the WPCA. The WPCA is worth approximately 1.2 uh, megawatts, the school is approximately one megawatt, and the town is approximately 800 kilowatts. Um, while all of the available credits are, are in the queue, um, there may be some pieces that aren't spoken for yet. Um, they're, all, they're all tied to specific projects that have been approved by PIRA, but they may not all be obligated. And, and, and I would be remiss, I I'm, I'm operating off of memory, but you have close to 30 electrical accounts mm -hmm. that comprise that, that, that load. And you would only be able to offset 15 because you can only offset five per meter of a, of a renewable energy project. So in addition to that, that three cap that you talked about before, I think the more important thing is you can realistically only offset five per project. So you'd probably have to, with that load, you'd probably want to look at doing three much smaller projects, maybe with different developers, um, but to offset different pieces of your load. But you're not going to get your entire load under those projects because some of the load is just too small to be worth it. Charlie, I, I think uh, you had a question before. Have we addressed it? No, not yet. Um, it, it may not even pertain to this because it's, it's something that I know from residential. Um, I know from residential that they saw huge tax breaks. Um, is there any incentives for towns to go to solar, you know, in that regard? Well, not for the town for tax breaks, but there are per, what's called production tax credits um, that make it appetizing for certain tax equity financers to take over these projects so that there are still tax breaks that the developers get that make it enticing, which is part of why they can work out the savings so that even though it costs more in terms of raw um, dollars to build renewable energy, those federal tax breaks can make it cheaper. And I guess to, um, to Selectman Baker's point from earlier, that is a subsidy that does go to the project, but it's a federal subsidy, not a state subsidy. And it goes to anybody, not just right. Connecticut. Yeah, right. Because like a residential, they do that same type of incentive where, you know, they say, well, you know, your finances will be this, but usually that included with the tax break. That's if you give up the tax break to, you know, whomever you finance with. Correct. 
and I would okay. anticipate, and I would anticipate that that would be a deal between usually that's a closely guarded secret between the developer and its financiers as to who's taking the tax equity credits and that kind of thing. So, so that's, um, that's why the, the residential solar folks are always trying to get you to lease the panels from them and not buy the panels outright because if you buy them, they don't get the credit. And why I financed mine myself. Any other comments or questions? So, so I think, I think the, we're, the way we leave this, uh, I've already reached out to CCM to try and get their, their next uh, PPA rates. Um, and then based on what that is and, and where the legislature goes in the next six or eight weeks, um, I think we regroup and have another conversation at that point. Yeah, and I actually think it'll be four to six rather than six to eight. So yep, happy to regroup when we're done. Legislative time, my friends. <laughs> well, there's that. <laughs> Uh, all right, Lee, thank you so much for joining us. It's always great to work with you and um, certainly appreciate the expertise you brought to this. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. All right. Um, the next conversation uh, pertains to the communication we got last meeting from the WPCA. Um, there's some additional information in your packet in agenda item 10A. Um, this would include, um, uh, is Paul Anderson still on? Here's Paul. Paul Anderson, Len Norton, and Joe Sauerhoff. Um, so, you guys remember the communications we got from uh, attorney Lanza, um, yeah. which again was the first time I heard anything about this issue was from their attorney. Um, They have since provided additional information. Uh, I'm going to ask Paul to go ahead and explain um, what it is they're thinking, and then I think Len and Joe have some uh, some additional background that might be helpful. Chairman Anderson. Okay. So uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Again, I can't tell. Okay. Uh, just to give you some background, uh, one of the things that brought to light all of these problems was the North Road sewer project and the repaving of North Road. Now that's a state project, but it pointed out the problem that exists. Uh, DOT decided when they were gonna pave that road, they were just gonna pave it and all utilities would be covered. And that would be the end of it. Uh, when that's all said and done, we've got manholes out there, uh, 40 of them, that had to be uncovered. You have to have access to your sewer manholes. That cost us $50,000. The sewer ratepayers had to pay that bill. The state reimburses $325 per manhole raised eventually. It cost us $1,875 per manhole to get that job done. So that difference in cost increased our sewer rates, our sewer user rate, because it had to be paid for. But it was an existing utility that was 100% functional and made non-functional by the method of paving the road. Other towns for their internal work, and the Manchester example I gave you, was they require the contractor working on the road to put it back in the condition it was. And that's what that's all about. The cost of paving a road is intended to be borne by the entire tax paying population having the burden of recovering existing facilities by sewer rate payers is an unfair burden on a select group. Currently, DOT, uh, this was all brought to DOT's uh, attention by a group of towns and the 
Connecticut Association of Water Pollution Control Authorities, and they're going back and reviewing their policy since this price has this $325 price has been in effect for 20 years. It's an unrealistic number. It's a fixed number, and it doesn't relate to reality. They choose to pave roads, just pave them. Uh, Tromley Road was paved in this manner. Scanic Road was paved in this manner. And recovering those sewer manholes is a cost to a select group that had no input or did nothing wrong to create that expense. So we believe that as Manchester and Vernon and a whole bunch of towns do, that that should be part of the RFP for redoing the road, that it puts everything back the way it's supposed to be. That's the basic thrust of this whole concept, to put the burden of the cost on the users of the road, which is everybody. Okay, I'm going to chime in now, and I beg to differ with Paul Anderson, because on Scantic Road and Tromley Road, we gave the Water Pollution Control Authority a minimum of one year, letting them know what we were going to be doing. We did not just pave over their structures without giving them any notice. They had plenty of time to determine and think about what they wanted to do. They chose not to do anything. As a matter of fact, on both of those roads, we left uh, Tromley in particular, I remember, and I believe Scantic as well, and I got yelled at by the bus company because of it. We left those roads after we pulverized and graded them in that condition for weeks, allowing the manhole covers to be raised in an appropriate manner by the appropriate authority, and they chose not to do it. So at some point we have to pave our roads and we pave them. As far as the Manchester um, bid document goes, I called the public works director in Manchester, who I've known for over 30 years, and I explained to him what I was dealing with. And his response was, well, that's interesting because number one, sewer and water are all under public works in Manchester. But that being said, there's a cost sharing on any road project that you do not see in this bid document that you were shown. The town of Manchester puts, number one, puts out an RFP for the paving. The town of East Windsor does not do that. We don't do enough paving in a year to get our own bid. We go off the state bid, which is basically a paving bid. They'll mill, they'll pulverize or reclaim, it, if you want to call it that, and pave. So we do not put out a separate bid document. The town of Manchester, I was told, that is a cost sharing associated with that bid document that you see there or RFP that you don't see in the RFP. The town of Manchester pays the contractor to go out and do the project. Then they invoice or, or whatever you want to call it, the water department pays for any water structures that have to be raised or adjusted. And the sewer department or sewer division pays out of their budget for any manholes that have to be raised or lowered or what have you. So it's similar to what would be done right here in East Windsor with the Water Pollution Control Authority. The, the payment and cost of the project is shared by the utilities and the people who are having the work done. Manchester, the highway department pays for the actual road paving and milling, what have you. So what we're doing in East Windsor is no different than what they're doing in, in uh, Manchester. And I take exception to the fact that, I, that it's out there that we just pave over structures like that without giving anybody any notice, because that's not true at all. Thank you. Uh, questions or comments from members of the board for either Paul or Len? Yes, um, oh, go ahead, Marie. Yeah, I was um, just going to say, my concern when we got the letter was the fact that Water Pollution Control Authority didn't come to us ahead of time. Um, I agree that you have some concerns. 
on your side, Paul, and I agree um, the way our town is doing the bid. But if there's an issue and there's a misunderstanding, and I just felt that you guys should have came to us first before we got it from an attorney, that's all. Because I don't know what the ramification is of that letter from the attorney is gonna be for the town. And I would, um, I would second uh, Marie's comment on, uh, you know, the first we hear this is a letter from a lawyer. I, I think that starts the conversation in the wrong direction. Uh, and I, it's almost rude. Um, but other than that, we can move past that. Uh, I, I was curious, do we have or do we need to um, set a written policy that both uh, entities could agree to and, and, you know, that way from going forward, everybody knows exactly what their role is and um, what their responsibilities are. And we don't have these kind of, I guess, unnecessary dust-ups. I guess, I, I guess my question would be for, for along those, that line of thought, Alan, question for either Len or Paul is, how prevalent of an issue is this on town roads? Um, I mean, it's, I don't know what part of Scantic you're, you're referring to. The Scantic is in, at least in part a state road. Um, how, how prevalent is this of an issue here? And is, is a year's notice not sufficient? That seems like it should be. I, I, I do not have information on any notifications that were provided. This subject has been brought up in the past, but it was a different board of selectmen. Um, and uh, it was brought up as a, a general issue, not a solution. What we're looking for is what are we gonna do in the future? We're not looking at the past. We're just using past examples of what has taken place. And we're not saying it was taken place in a um, an adversarial manner or a negative manner. It's just the way it's been done over the years. So we're looking as what can we do for the future? Um, perhaps the attorney's letter wasn't the way you'd like to see it, but this is a, an ongoing battle with state uh, a lot of people, a lot of money over the course of a uh, number of years. And um, I, I'll be honest with you, I don't necessarily see all these communications because the authority doesn't deal with day-to-day -day operations of the, of the system. We deal with policy. So there may oh. be things that have happened that I'm not aware of, and I won't deny that. That is a possibility. Um, so we're not here to uh, create uh, a, a divide. We're just trying to come up with a future solution and who pays for what and, and, and what is appropriate. So whatever, would we be interested in some kind of a, uh, an agreement, memo of understanding, whatever, certainly. The whole idea is we're all one town, no matter how you do it. So we have to work together, not against each other. So that's fine. We can come up with a well, little. Paul, I, yes. I take exception to the fact that you weren't made aware of, but I sat in over a year's worth of meetings with Art, and sometimes Ed was there. And every time we went through a land use meeting, we discussed what we were doing and I brought up the paving projects of both Tromley and Wells, and they knew about it. Now, regardless if they don't communicate well with their board, then I think you have a problem with their board, but we communicate very well via emails and with the sewer department. And I'm just gonna push back on the comments that, um you know, the, the WPCA wasn't aware of the communication going through the attorney because I, I have emails from Art on an unrelated matter saying that he needs to consult with the WPCA before going to their attorney. So was he was he inaccurate in representing that to me on that separate matter or is that not the case here? 
No, that is that is absolutely true. You are correct. We uh, did have our attorney write the letter. Did the authority okay. did? I'm not saying we did not. Our okay. goal was to come up with a solution for the future. I guess I would question your comments, yeah. Alan. Yeah. Start by punching somebody in the nose. It's you know starts the conversation in the wrong in the wrong lane. I think you know, um, and I and I think this is okay. We have an informal verbal agreement that doesn't seem to be working. So I think we can fix this with you know writing it down and everybody understanding exactly what their responsibility and their role is and that you know a specific line of communication that's going to happen. And I think this is over. And and uh, I think you know everybody be all set. I mean because you know writing a letter that costs money having a lawyer writer and then that's that's like a waste that's a waste of money you know um, and i think we can just all just work this out uh between the town and and the authority and uh and probably ed uh, but i don't know i guess I'm just kind of a little flabbergasted that we're at this point so really i think we should just need need to have the right people sit down and, and create in writing you know who's going to do what when I have a quick question. Uh, so there will be an opportunity for the public to address the board later in the meeting. Um, Sarah, did you have your hand up? Yes, thanks. Um, Sarah Mosca Selectman. I just, um, I agree with Selectman Baker. Um, I think he has the right track, something going there with coming up with something and getting it in writing. So there's, it's clearly spelled out. So there isn't any back and forth and we can proceed forward. So a problem like this doesn't arise again. Other questions or comments from members of the board? Jason, what control do we have over the state for the road? I mean, we have control over our town roads, but we don't have any control over the state. And if the issue is with the state, um, I have no problem with us putting something in writing, moving forward for the town, but the other we have no control over. Yeah, no, we have, we have less than zero control over the state. Uh, if there are no other comments, um, we can move on to 10B, um, which is a uh, discussion of the three, 343 North Road easements. So by way of background here, um, 343 North Road is currently owned by John and Dan Burnham. Uh, it's where the, ironically, it's where the pump station for the WPCA is on North Road. And um, they are in the process of selling that to a third party. Uh, and as part of that transaction, um, John is trying to negotiate um, with the new property owner an easement that would be available for uh, passive recreation to try and, and help build the connectivity and the usage of the Scantic River um, and the AHRC trails. So uh, we were a third party to that conversation. There's the buyer, there's the seller, and there's us. Um, they have not done uh, closing yet. Um, both parties, I think, agree that, that there would be an easement that was put in place for passive use. Um, but before we can do that, we need to do what's called an 824 referral. Um, and I, in, I included the uh, correspondence supporting this and the statute. So you guys can take a look at what an 824 referral is. Um, so before we can take any formal action on the um, potential granting of the easement to the town, we need to lateral this over to planning and zoning for them to, to review the proposal and make a recommendation back to the town. Um, ultimately, because it's an acquisition of property, even through a gift, um, it would need to go through a town meeting. And I made clear to the seller that that's not, or to the buyer rather, that that's not likely to happen in the short term, um, but that they can continue and, and their attorneys have, have concurred that they can continue with the real estate transaction, understanding that the easement would be adopted by the town at a town. Um, 
in order for that process even to go forward, though, we need to do the 8 foot um, So I think the last iteration of this was a 50 foot easement on both sides or on, on both banks of the, the Scantic River, is my recollection. Um, that might have shrunk slightly, but I don't believe it has. I haven't seen that for sure. So um, that's kind of the story there. Are there questions? Being none, um, I think a motion would be in order to refer the potential granting of the easement at 343 North Road to the Planning and Zoning Commission for an 824 referral. Make that motion. Selectman Nordell will second that motion. Motion is made and seconded. Discussion. Sarah looks like she's trying. There you go. Did you say for? 824, is that correct? Even it's though- 8, 20, 824 referral, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I understand now, sorry. And and that's 8-24 uh, of the general statutes. There's another one that happens relatively regularly in the land use space called an 830G referral. In each case, they're referencing the statute. Thank you. I guess I would just uh, add that the reason why this matters is uh, this easement has been like, kind of unofficial since Mr. Burnham owned it and AHRC built a uh, trail on the um, east side of the river and there are plans uh, you know eventually as uh, easements exist in other properties on the west side that to, to extend that trail system uh, you know if we had enough manpower or if they had enough manpower and you know so ran out of trail space on the east side that's being worked now so I guess that's that's why this is relevant to us and I think it's a um, a good thing for us to do. It allows us a little bit more um, capability to, you know, protect that that uh, watershed area. So I think it's a great idea. And by protect, I mean protect by having a trail recreational system there, and you know, um, that comes with that. Other comments? I think I think we've all um, utilized. Trail that's out there. It's a beautiful resource. The New Year's Day hike is a is an awesome event that hopefully will happen. Um, and anything that we can do to support them in strengthening that uh, resource for the communities of win. So, um, there are no other comments. I'll call the roll, and we'll refer this over to PZC. Selectman Baker. Aye. Selectman Muska. Aye. Selectman Nordell. Aye. Selectman D'Souza. Aye. All right. I lost my agenda. Uh, tax refunds. Sarah Muska, Selectman, I'll move to approve the tax refunds totaling $783.57. There a second. Okay. D'Souza. Motion has been made and seconded. Any further discussion? Selectman Baker. Aye. Selectman Musto. Aye. Selectman Nordell. Aye. Selectman D'Souza. Aye. All right. Selectman's reports. The last two weeks have been a bit challenging in terms of managing COVID-19 in the community. Um, while our uh, while our community-wide numbers remain constant or consistently low, we did have an outbreak among farm, farm workers at Mulnight Farms and at Bluebell Mattress in the industrial park. In both cases, town officials worked with the local health district, the Connecticut Department of Public Health, and in the case of the Mulnight Farm circumstance, with the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Labor. Our shared, our shared goal in both cases was to work with business owners to ensure property pro proper protocols were followed to protect community spread of the virus into East Windsor, and in both cases, that objective was successfully accomplished. Both of these instances should serve as a reminder to us all that the COVID-19 pandemic is not over, and we're likely to see more of these outbreak, outbreaks as local schools and colleges resume operations and as cold and flu season sneaks up on us. This year's voting process may be different from years past. 
Every registered voter in the state will receive an absentee ballot application that will be sent out to their homes starting next week. If you decide that you want to vote by absentee rather than in person, you'll need to fill out the application and return it to the town clerk, either through the US mail or in the clearly marked drop box that's outside the town hall. Beginning on or about October 2nd, the town clerk will mail the actual ballots to voters. Once received, voters will need to fill out and return the actual ballot, either by US mail or in the drop box. We're expecting very high numbers of absentee ballots this year, so to be sure your votes counted, please return it as soon as possible. All ballots must be received by the town clerk by 8 p.m. on November 3rd. Of course, traditional in-person voting will be taking place that same day from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. for anyone who's comfortable voting that way. On August 27th, the Board of Selectmen agreed to forward three questions amending the town charter to town voters for them to consider on November 3rd, which is the same day as the presidential election. The questions will appear on the ballot and involve technical and grammatical corrections, renaming the town treasurer as the finance director and requiring both the initial budget recommendation drafted by the first selectman and the initial drafted budget recommendation by the superintendent for the Board of Education to be available for public review five days prior to the first public hearing outside of the budget process. These are modest proposals for voters to consider, but the most significant aspect of putting these questions forward during a presidential election is to have the broadest possible level of participation from our voters, which a presidential election allows. The charter affects everyone, so having as many people as possible vote on any changes that it ensues is, is more representative and, and something that I think is important and I think the board thinks it's important. On August 31st, I had the pleasure of swearing in Rich Austin as the town's new fire marshal. Rich has been helping out in that capacity on an interim basis for a number of months and was the unanimous choice of the Board of Select. He's already hard at work modernizing that office and has been an active participant in our economic development activities for some time. We are delighted to welcome Rich to the team from the On September 1st, a town meeting was held to discuss an ordinance that would eliminate the tax disparity situation between those who live within the, fire, the Warehouse Point Fire District and those who live outside the district. The full text of the ordinance can be found on the town's website, and this will also be on the presidential ballot for all of the town's people to consider. That's all I have, um, respectfully submitted. Selectman D'Souza. Yep, I have a short report this month. Um, on Tuesday, September 1st, um, via Zoom, I attended the Economic Development Commission meeting. Um, due to the conflict of another meeting in town at seven, they used a park and rec number and they had some difficulty um, in signing on for that. But nonetheless, through um, patience, um, the meeting will start, was started. Um, Ruth Ann Calabrese, the new uh, zoning wetlands enforcement officer, was kind enough to uh, sign on and introduce herself to the um, board. Um, the kudos to her for doing that. Um, basically, the only conversation that took place during that meeting was for them to um, they talked about the 10 year plan um, of conservation um, development and asked if they could get hard copies of that, which um, Peg is going to do that if she hasn't already given those out to everyone so that they can look at the plan uh, for the future. So this way they can start targeting and what they need to do will be forward. The website, um, because of the issue with um, the connectivity, um, the person in charge of that wasn't able to get on, so they tabled that to the next meeting. Um, and then uh, Jim Richard from the Chamber of Commer Commerce mentioned um, that they're doing a contest um, in order to um, entice people to come out to local businesses um, for uh, meals. Um, I believe it's called Eat, Eat Out. Um, you go to an establishment in town, you submit your receipt with your name and your address on the back and your phone number um, to the Chamber of Commerce or drop it off at the Chamber office. Um, and then you'll be in the drawing for a 55 inch TV. Um, and then the other meeting that I was scheduled to attend is the uh, Bradbrook Mill, which was uh, September 2nd, but because of the uh, standstill with that, that meeting was canceled. And that's all I have. Selectman Baker. Uh, I'm going to skip over the charter and the fire ordinance <laughs> and uh, the fire marshal because I'm sure everybody will have something to say on that. So um, I, I guess all I'd say about all of that is uh, 
it's a good body of work, and I think that's something that we can uh, all be proud of. Uh, last night at the wetlands meeting, they had a couple of items of interest. Uh, number one, they welcomed the new uh, uh, zoning and wetlands enforcement officer and voted uh, her in, Ruth Ann Calabrese, uh, as the town's wetlands enforcement agent. Um, they also heard an application and approved an application for the town of East Windsor. Apparently the 72 inch culvert that goes under South Water Street, um, you know, that, that drains, you know, it's basically the blue ditch and some other stuff that's draining through there into the river. That is on the, potentially on the verge of collapse and needs emergency work. Um, and they're gonna sleeve it instead of completely replace it because um, it's, you know, probably about half the cost um, so anyway, that uh, that job that that permit was approved. They have other permits that they need to try to chase down with deep, but are having a hard time getting a hold of them. Um, but anyway, that that work will commence next week. It's kind of already underway, but as far as getting the preparatory work done. But so that was a kind of interesting, and um, I think we kind of got lucky that that didn't completely come apart and cause us a larger issue. Uh, the other thing that they Wetlands Agency worked on was uh, the continued work with the new wetlands fine ordinance that uh, has been kind of in the hopper. Uh, work was started on it prior to the COVID outbreak and was put on hold for a little while because some of the members <clears throat> weren't attending meetings. Um, and uh, we've picked that back up and that uh, is would probably be coming in front of the Board of Selectmen soon. Uh, the, a lot of the documents and the ordinance and all the pertinent documents were already vetted by lawyers and uh, they're just being kind of dusted off and updated for, you know, they last were updated in 2012. One of them includes a policy document uh, for the town staff to, uh, to follow. So they are giving, they're using the ordinance correctly uh, uh, on every uh, violation. So that's been referred back to the current uh, staff and uh, for selectman's office so they can go over it and see if they want any changes and then other than that um, they'll be making a presentation putting that together and uh, presenting that to the board of selectmen uh, for their approval and then to a, a public hearing and eventually to a town meeting so um, a lot of work with that and um, expect to see that you know finished up probably by january or february uh, that's all i have for you thank you sir <clears throat> Selectman Nordell. Um, since our last meeting, I attended this year's first PTO meeting. Uh, the PTO uh, has decided to allow this year's memberships to be free to all families with children in the elementary and middle school. Um, and they also discussed ideas on how they would do and hold fundraisers for this year with um, dealing with COVID. So they'll be working on that. Um, I was sad to see this um, to see the decision of having the Charter Revision Commission's hard work turned down by this board. Um, we talked about not taking away voter rights and how we didn't agree with doing that, yet we did it anyways by not letting the public make the final decision on whether to eliminate or hold the 2%. Um, great out to everyone involved in the Brookbrook Fire Department ordinance and getting that sent forth to the voters for November. Um, hopefully this is the light at the end of the tunnel to a long overdue solution. Um, 827, I attended the Beautification Commission meeting. Um, at this meeting, they talked about the placement of a small outdoor food pantry placed at 40 Mill Street in Broadbrook. Uh, this was supported by uh, the Harper Bags of Love and the Beautification Commission. Uh, they had an official ribbon cutting on Sunday afternoon, August 23rd, with Select Muska, uh, Senator Anwar, and members of the Beautification Commission and uh, Bags of Love. Uh, the commission already has plans for more locations in town, and uh, they also talked about doing more projects through the Keep America Beautiful um, campaign. And that's all I have. Thank you, sir. Selectman Muster. Uh, Selectman Nordell just mentioned, on August 24th, I attended the ribbon cutting at East Windsor's new Free Little Pantry at 40 Mill Street in Broadbrook. Thank you to the Hartford Bags of Love and the East Windsor Beautification Committee for collaborating together to make sure that our friends and neighbors have an anonymous, guilt-free way to obtain food should they need it. 
The Board of Education held their regular meeting on August 26th via Zoom. Dr. DeBarge introduced two new hires, a new assistant principal at East Windsor Middle School, Linda Deitch, and Director of Building and Grounds, William Quinones. The school district's COVID-19 grants of $460,000 have been approved and the district was notified that they are eligible for another grant of approximately $300,000. East Windsor Public Schools has been approved to be a free breakfast and lunch district for all students. Our eligibility was a, over 40% last year. This will be a huge resource for families, ensuring that all children will eat have the opportunity to eat two meals a day. The district is hoping for greater participation, which would equal a higher reimbursement rate. At the time of this meeting, 20% of students have opted out. Specifics were still being worked on for laptop distribution and meals for students that aren't going back to school still needed consideration. Middle school sports are officially postponed until winter and after school clubs are postponed till at least October 1st. Um, I, I touched on the charter meeting, um, the town marshal and the town meeting, which I will leave out, but I'll post online. Over the past few weeks, I was proud to organize a mask giveaway with Bob and Amy Stefanowski of Masks for CT for our East Windsor School District. Because of them and the two businesses that sponsored this event, I was able to present Dr. DeBarge with enough masks for every student in our district. My wish is that this will take some of the wary and financial burden off of the school district and families. Yesterday, Sergeant Julian Knowles of the East Windsor Police Department and I were honored to be guests on a podcast episode titled, How East Windsor is Helping People Experiencing Domestic Violence part of the series called Reaching Out with the Network, hosted by Annalisa Deal. We discussed how police officers handle domestic violence calls, restraining orders, and what you can do to help victims of domestic violence. I'd like to thank them for having me, and I hope that the information shared can be of assistance to those seeking help, and I will post the link with my report in case anyone wishes to listen. And wishing all of our students and teachers a happy and healthy new school year. And I hope that you all have a safe Labor Day weekend. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. We're now going to go on to public participation. This is the uh, public's second opportunity to address the board. Um, I'd ask that uh, members who are interested in speaking state their name and their address for the record. Um, are there any comments from members of the public? Yes, Nicole Vasilla, 53 Prospect Hill Drive. I just wanted to go back to the paving over the manholes issue. Um, I am no construction worker. I haven't been following this along. So this is a, um, a, a rookie question, I, I believe. But is there ever a reason to pave over an active manhole? And if so, uh, was that scenario in place? Uh, thank you, ma'am. I, I have no idea what the answer to that question is. I, that'd be something I would um, ask of uh, Len Norton or Joe Sauerhofer or um, Paul Anderson. Um, Joe, do you want to address that? I would be happy to, Jerry. No, uh, we never plan on paving over anything. Uh, especially manholes because we, we're fully aware of that you need to access them. That's why they're there to clean the pipes out and make sure that the flow of everything is flowing properly. Um, the, the big concern here, and I, I think the town just took a little bit of the hit was, is the state, I believe gave ample notification, but when the state says they're going to do something, there's no stopping the state. They just, do it and 140 was in dire need of being paved. I think that was part of the problem is six months isn't enough time for the store plant to come up with the money to raise or adjust them. I think they need a whole budget year to make sure to budget it just like we budget for things. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from members of the public? Seeing none, uh, we will have an executive session. Uh, it will include Chief DeMarco. 
Um, so I'd ask for a motion to go into executive session pertaining to CPS 1-206A to discuss a personnel matter. Selectman Nordell, so moved. Sarah Muska, Selectman, second. Any discussion? Selectman Baker. Aye. Selectman Muska. Aye. Selectman Nordell. Aye. Selectman D'Souza. Aye. We're going into executive session at 821. Uh, Peg, there will likely be a vote afterwards. Uh, I'll get the meeting posted uh, early tomorrow morning and um, you can get the details from that. Thank you. Thanks, have a great night. Thank you. Good evening, Chief. How are you? I'm good. How did I get luck unlucky number 13 on the on the list here? Don't forget to take off the record. Oh, thank you, Sarah. You're welcome. It is 842. I'm going to call the board back to order, having come out of executive session. Um, Selectman Musco. I move to adjust the stipend line for emergency management up by $13,595. Is there a second? I'll second Selectman that. Selectman Nordell will second that. Uh, I got Marie first. Uh, motion made by Sarah, seconded by Marie. I would just uh, explain that this in, this increase does include adding an additional uh, high-ranking member to the emergency management team um, to uh, kind of bolster the, the available resources that are there. Chief, I would also like to thank you for the work that you've put in, especially over the last month. Um, but uh, certainly during 2020, you and Deputy Chief Hart have been uh, certainly examples for your department. And um, I, I thank you for that on behalf of the town. And um, I think that this expansion of the EM team makes a lot of sense. So thank you for your willingness to, to serve. Other comments? Thank you very much. Okay. I couldn't agree with I couldn't agree with you more, Jason. This has been a trying year for everyone. Um, and when you think of emergencies, we got to think beyond tornadoes and wind damage um, because it's a whole new world out there now. So, um, and our police department, certainly you're right. They've stepped up on every single occasion. So kudos to all of them. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Selectman Baker. Aye. Selectman Muska. Aye. Selectman Nordell. Aye. Selectman D'Souza. Aye. Motion carries. I have no further business to come before the Board of Selectmen, so a motion would be in order to adjourn. Selectman Sarah Nordell Muska. will move to adjourn. Second. I got Charlie only because he finished the sentence. Finish the sentence. <laughs> Moved by Selectman Nordell, seconded by Selectman Muska. Any further discussion? It's non debatable. Uh, Selectman Baker. Aye. Selectman Muska. Aye. Selectman Nordell. Aye. Selectman D'Souza. Aye. We are adjourned at 8 44 p.m. Chief, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.